I'm, I'm Eddie and the founder of Round Hill Roastery. We set up in 2012, maybe turn it down a tiny bit, sorry. Um, I'm sure if you've been to this coffee shop, which I assume you all have as you're here tonight, um, you would have probably seen these blue, blue and pink bags kicking around. Um, we've been a coffee roastery for oh, almost 12 years now. We've worked with Jess and, Jeff and Lucy since day one, um, so we've got, always had a nice relationship, so thank you for hosting me to do this event. Um, I am going to talk about sustainable sourcing, but I'm also going to give a, apologies if you actually know lots about coffee, but I'm going to give a bit of a general overview of coffee, how it's produced, where it's produced, and we'll talk about seasonality. And then my bit on sustainable sourcing is I really want to kind of like get stuck into some of the experiences I've had over the past 10 years of buying coffee for a coffee company, 12 years actually, I forget. Um, but also to discuss some of the changes that I've witnessed in that relatively short period of time and how the industry has changed. And really that's my purpose for talking about sustainability, about what, how it's going to go as we go forward and some of the trends that I kind of, I've witnessed and things that I've, I see that I think there's maybe some issues with and things that need to, to kind of be addressed within the industry. Um, and that's, that's really from our side, but um, I, I think it's also nice to think about as a consumer, to be able to have that kind of end, that person in the middle that can kind of bridge the gap. Because for a lot of people who really love coffee and have worked in coffee, they never meet a coffee farmer or a coffee producer. And that's really, even people working in roasteries, quite often it's not a select few people that might travel to buy coffees. And so actually there's millions and millions of people who drink coffee every day, but don't consider the farm. And actually that's been really positive about what the kind of specialty movement's done. But I think as we go forward, there'll be changes and things that need, to, things will have to be adapted for how, how we can continue to produce more and more and more specialty coffee because it's a growing industry. Um, so, um, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit there, but um, I'll start again. I'm Eddie from Round Hill Racing. Um, so we've got here, like, this is, this is kind of like a um, kind of mission statement. So we've got here, like, our mission is to link farmers with consumers and educate in a farm to cut manner, building a sustainable business around diet relationships with producers while celebrating progression and sustainable, sustainable agricultural practices. There we go. Um, so I just kind of summarised that really, but I think a big part of... Um, tonight as well as I, I, I want to kind of discuss some, some kind of buzzwords and things and then also I want to talk about the main thing I will talk about in this is to do with coffee pricing which I'm sure are affecting a lot of people right now and I want to give a wider overview as to why some things are what they are these days and what they weren't. Uh, but anyway let's move on. We're here in Birmingham. Um, so uh, Coffee grows, this is called a coffee belt. So um, it's between the tropics of Cancer and the tropic of Capricorn. This is like anywhere in here you can produce coffee within reason. You can't exactly produce it in the Sahara Desert. Um, what does coffee like? It likes mountainous regions. Um, so if we look at Central America, this a region here is great. We have the Andes that run through here, which is great in South America. Main producing areas in Africa um, that we would buy coffee from typically would be East Africa here. So Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Burundi. There is some production over here too, but it tends to be a slightly of lower quality in West Africa. And there's large, large production in the Congo. It's a very difficult place to buy coffee from. Also, you've got coffee in Yemen as well. And the biggest change I've kind of witnessed in the past uh, 10 to 12 years is a really big rise in specialty coffee coming from Asia. Um, typically as well, good production, massive production in Vietnam. Just look straight into the projector, that was clever. Uh, and uh, also through um, uh, in the Philippines and in Thailand, and then also bizarrely some in Australia. Um, that's a bit more of a, not a serious coffee producing country in my opinion. Uh, there are some rogue places. Um, very recently, I tried some coffee grown in Denmark. Um, notoriously cold and extremely flat country. Um, but had a really nice anaerobic geisha that was grown in a polytunnel. 
Um, so it is doable. Um, you can grow coffee, of course, in your house, but you will not really yield much fruit. Uh, and I don't think you get what we'd, you could particularly get a good harvest to even make probably half a cup of coffee. Um, so this is, oh, it's a shame. It's looked much nicer on him. Anyway, these fruits look a bit more bright and vibrant on a proper screen. Um, this, maybe if I, no, it's a dangerous idea. Um, this is a coffee cherry. So as you've all cupped coffees, I'm sure you're all aware that coffee is a fruit. Yes, good, good, good. Um, so like all fruits, the riper the fruit, the better. Um, this is a, this image is a bit of a kind of confusing one. I kind of like to look at this. This is typical of a uh, coffee producing country. This is typical of Colombian coffee. Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on. You've got unripe coffee cherry here, very ripe cherry here. This is like almost getting there. There's some overripes too. Uh, that's quite unusual in most coffee producing countries because the way coffee trees grow, like so, um, you'll have one main harvest per year. So all the fruit tends to mature around the same time, pretty much like most fruit trees, how they grow. It'd be quite rare to have um, kind of like, a, which I think like an apple tree where you can just constantly pick throughout the year. That's not going to really happen. Um, so I thought that was quite an interesting image just to show all the different stages here. But so coffee here, you can see this is taken in, um, in Honduras. Um, they're kind of like large shrubs, really. Um, there's all kinds of different varieties of coffee um, and they give different flavors. But the main reason for varietals um, typically is to do with yield. So if you're a farmer, you want to maximize your return from your produce and your land. Um, and so that's why actually we have a really wide amount of varietals is because typically they are, how much fruit can I get from this tree? Um, obviously things have changed a lot recently and now farmers are starting to produce different varietals purely for flavor. Um, some countries, I go back to Colombia, uh, the government forces you to grow special certain varieties. So if you look at the main varietal grown, grown in Colombia, it's the varietal is called Colombia. Uh, and that was given by the government to incentivize GDP. So incentivize money for the country because it's the one their main exports. Um, so anyway, we're picking these cherries. Lovely. Um, these are all harvested at different times. And then other stages you have is flowering and then you get your kind of uh, your cherries come a bit later on. Um, then obviously we have all the processing. So I'm jumping the gun a lot because I want to get onto sustainability. But we're going to taste a, lot, a wide variety of processing methods. Is, is everyone familiar with the different processing methods of coffee? Good, this is like a really, this is great. So. Um, once you've picked all your cherries, there's a, a washed process, which is where you ferment the coffee cherries in water. That is to kind of stop the sugars in the fruit from just rotting the seeds inside. Um, then there's a whole bunch of other different processing methods, but the main two I'm going to just really discuss because obviously there's so many sub varieties of processing, but would be natural. Most of the world's coffee production is actually natural process. Um, washed is actually accounts for quite a small amount of the production and tends to happen in countries where water is a bit more common, um, which is kind of helpful when you look at geographically where coffee is grown because it tends to be more in kind of, kind of rainforesty type conditions. But there are countries where water is more difficult. Um, so natural is common. Um, I have a very kind of like small mind like view when it comes to looking at coffee farms and my knowledge is is quite limited and I found it quite shocking when I've traveled and witnessed I think we all are people who love high-end specialty coffee and we assume that everything is done with maximum care and attention and love and it's it's quite shocking when you travel and realize that most of the coffee that's sold is usually picked and just dried on the floor so the cherries are left on tarpaulin or they're left on a roadside and then they're swept up and someone will sell that on 
This is typical for most coffee, which is actually why lots of commercial coffees do just taste a bit like mud, really, not very tasty. Um, they're also like grown with, uh, this is like, this is quite unique to see. Obviously, you, you will typically grow in rows like most farms would. It's more practical for picking. Um, however, uh, there's a lot of space. Uh, also, you'll notice all of the trees in the background. This is all owned by a, a farmer who I'll talk about a bit later, but they, they clearly care about the land and their environment. Um, that's also something I've picked up from travels. It's very uncommon, actually, to see a lot of farms like this. Um, it's, also, um, it's also pretty uncommon to see they're all pretty much the same height, so they've been like, lovingly pruned and kept well. All these things are steps that are like are being pushed and promoted a lot by kind of I would say more communication between roaster and buyer and barista and consumer has gone back to farmers because actually um, farming might have just been done that well that's just how I've always done it and it's still the case like uh, traveled some parts of Colombia and they're like why did you do this and they're like I don't know we always did it's like have you tasted your coffee no. And it's, that's still really common, even with really amazing farms. Um, the family here, which is a, coffee, the, a farm called Caballero, I'll show you the pictures of Marisabel and Moises later. Um, they're very fortunate because they've grown an extremely successful business and so they've been able to travel so they can meet people like us and they can talk about coffees and they can come to cafes. This is super normal. Um, and that feedback goes into farm, but what also is great with those kind of relationships is they, they will then help other people within their community develop their farms. And actually, this is really the direction I think that a lot of producers are trying to go, go through because uh, to be able to, to kind of like actually taste their coffee, it's pretty special. And also then to actually like learn about how to farm it by actually tasting it is a kind of a bit of a kind of backward logic. It might just be, well, that's what works better. But actually what pays better for the farmer is to have better quality for their produce. There were people like us will pay more money for the coffee because it tastes nice. In turn, will improve their land and usually improve the local environment too. Um, they do a lot of like rewilding. They planted a lot. They own 350 hectares of land, which is quite, quite large for a, for a coffee farmer. Um, and they put a lot of it back to like natural trees and shade trees, which in turn helps the soil. And all these steps that are just a positive for everything, really. Um, that's a very quick, brief potted history. Sorry, I kind of rushed through that. Um, please ask any questions at the end if you have like more direct questions. But I'm going to move a bit more onto the kind of sustain sustainable sustainability angle and discussion on on money, which is really fun. Um, so. What does it mean? Um, I've got here a, a multitude of different things, which is you know very classic, like a, a business thing to say, right? Yeah, we care about all sustainability. Um, I've I've actually taken some things off our website that we've put, which is pretty normal for most companies to put, but I think are actually the reality is is. Um, I think they're kind of basic and a bit of a given, so it's a bit of a critique on what we do in general. So um, you'll see a lot of this like, oh, it's 100% renewable energy and we've got fully recyclable packaging and we try to not have any wastage. Um, we do all our deliveries in reusable containers. These are things that I think are expected, right, of any business these days and a, and a, and a given, especially in the UK and in, in Europe. Um, but within the coffee industry, we have like a kind of like a, a bit of a deeper thing to kind of think about. I think it's really, I think this, this kind of notion of greenwashing is kind of like quite a kind of big thing, especially for me. I, I kind of like, um, I really want to kind of dig a bit deeper into like, is that of, God, of, is that of good benefit to all people within that, you're not just your supply chain, but all the way through to whoever's consuming it. Um, and so I think it's, um, I found, uh, this is me sounding a bit old and cynical actually, I realise, but I feel that like it's, it's quite easy to like just bring up all these buzzwords and feel like oh, I've ticked all the boxes, great, I'm done. Um, and actually I think 
uh, there's a kind of a larger a larger part about what we do, especially in the coffee industry, which is to kind of actually talk about things like this and educate on what what's going to be sustainable for the, the, a the longevity of the business. Um, obviously, coffee has been grown commercially for several hundred years, um, and I I think it's it, it is not slowing down. It's not like pe less people are drinking coffee. More and more people are drinking coffee. And uh, more and more people worldwide are drinking coffee. And what is the long-term impact on, on farming? I'm going to just scoot back to this. That's a huge area you can produce coffee in. Um, but there's problems with some of the main producing places within, within this area. Um, Two years ago, there was frost in Brazil. It wiped out a huge amount of the production, which caused the coffee, coffee market to go insane because most commercial coffee still comes from Brazil, Brazil being one of the biggest producers. Vietnam is a sneaky, massive producer, but it's a bit of an unknown one here in, in, in Europe. Uh, all your instant coffee comes from Vietnam in Europe, basically. So Kenko will have, a, they have their own plant there and they ship it over as a finished product. Brazil makes all of uh, kind of Brazil's like kind of uh, instant coffee. I've been to an instant coffee plant in Colombia, which produces all of Colombia's instant coffee. It's a pretty weird place. It's like a it's a small town, and it's just constantly going. The whole place smells of coffee, and it's a constant hive of activity. Um, but the population's growing, and it's, climate change is really affecting farms. Um, but with that, there's new origins that are popping up. So China's producing more and more coffee and it has all the facilities to grow amazing quality coffee and I've been lucky to taste some of them throughout the years. And I've just noticed huge improvements in, in, those, in that quality as we go. So it, things will change. In the same way that if you look back way, way, way back in history, I mean like coffee only really was found here. Like that's really where coffee originates from. Uh, and then... Um, Being a seafaring nation and a kind of um, questionable evil empire of the world that, that Britain was back then, uh, took cultivars everywhere. So, like, all of the trees were either taken as. Because technically, you could germinate a green bean, an unroasted coffee seed, but it, it, it's kind of lost its window after a few months. So, to get a cherry, like a picked fruit, and then sail it over there would be quite quick today or you could you could FedEx it from Ethiopia to here if you wanted something and you could plant it within a few days obviously in the 1700s it might have taken a bit longer so um trees were taken on board boats and they were sailed across to establish in the so-called new world over here um and you can see links in in coffees that we favor in the UK East Africa Kenya for obvious reasons, well, Ethiopia, not never colonized Ethiopia, yes, so. Uh, Dutch also, somewhere here. Um, a lot of coffee from Sumatra in Dutch, in, within Dutch coffee culture, and that comes from historical roots. Um, uh, in Guatemala, a lot of the farmers, bizarrely, are, are German and Italian descent, and they moved over. So it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's always been a global business, because it has to be. But obviously it's growing and growing and growing, and so we're seeing new origins. And then some of the origins, origin being coffee producing country, sorry, I should just uh, state that, we call it an origin. Have you been on an origin trip? People are like, what? Have you, oh, we've been to a coffee farm, yeah. Um, I've, I've witnessed some difficult things and I talk about them and uh, that's actually something that I will discuss with one of the coffees that we'll taste as well, give you some context on some of the changes that are happening. Uh, and for me, this is all really within the coffee industry. Like, that's why I go back to this. These things are super easy to achieve. The other thing's really hard, really, really hard. It's pretty easy for me to buy renewable energy, and it's easy for me to choose recyclable packaging. Um, that should be improved on, but it's very hard to talk about changing the entire industry. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'll get this out of the way, um, coffee pricing. Um, I took this this morning uh, off, uh, I typed in commodity market, 
coffee. Uh, and it was uh, 185.40, which is $1.85 per pound. Um, that is the base price for coffee. So if I grow coffee and I want to sell it, I can sell it and get $1.85 today at today's price. Uh, if you go on, online and type in C price coffee, if this is fluctuating all day long. You're a farmer, you want to sell your coffee, you want the C price to be as high as it possibly can be so you can get the most money for your produce. Uh, when I started the roastery, I, I think I've got a slide somewhere else, the, the market was like, like here level. This is like eight, eight, 80 cents, 90 cents. Um, good business, really good, cheap. Buy cheap stuff and sell it for lots of money. That's kind of been the norm in the coffee industry for years. Um, you see things like rich aromas and a kind of a balanced flavor, all these kind of things. They kind of are a bit meaningless, right? Like especially rich aromas, that one does my head in. Um, that's not saying how something tastes. It's hiding something. Um, traditionally, if you look at most, if you look at most commercial coffees, there's absolutely no idea where that produce is from. You have no idea where it was grown. And rich aromas doesn't give you any indication of what it tastes like. And usually it tastes like leather and ashtrays. And like, that's the reality of how it's been farmed and the reality of how it's been produced. That's not the reality of what coffee tastes like. And we all know that, being coffee lovers, because it tastes like fruit, because it's a fruit. Um, the reality is it's just been farmers have had their price driven down by a commodity market, which is a, which is a mystery. It's like, oh, how much do you think it's going to be worth? Well, I think it could be worth this. Have you seen what's growing in Brazil? Oh, I don't know if it's good this year. Okay, well, it's, this is all that it's fluctuating. People are hedging money. What do you think production is going to be like? Should we, should we hedge a bit more? Should we, should we put money in? This is a floating thing that's constantly changing, but it's affecting everybody. This year, sorry, not this year, 2022 to uh, kind of the beginning, it was really good for farmers. And people were like, oh, great, your commodity market's at $2, $2 per pound plus. That's fantastic. Producers are getting loads of money. No, they weren't. It was just like you and I in the sense that, oh, everything's really expensive now, so I need a pay rise. Uh, well, that's not going to do anything. They were facing the exact same issues that we were. They were kind of in a kind of vicious, vicious bit of inflation. Um, so, uh, the C price, you would think, oh, how does the C price affect specialty? Because it's, uh, this is commodity coffee, not specialty coffee. But it's a base rate for everything. So, for example, when the market's high, the price of specialty goes up a tiny bit. When the price is really low, the price of specialty tends to stay the same, but does go down a bit. Um, because it's all to do with like cost of production and what I can achieve um, as a producer and as a buyer. There's a kind of always a correlation. Um, if the price is really, 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 really high, it's going to really, really affect like um, really high quality, well-produced coffees. Because if I can sell my coffee for a lot of money and do absolutely nothing, why do I want to handpick all the cherries and why do I want to clean all my equipment and lovingly like make sure the fermentation is good when I could just sell them as cherries to someone and get quite good revenue. So this is a bit of an interesting situation we've been in. I say we as a business, but also actually we as specialty coffee, I think really in the UK, I think that you really started to take off what we're doing today in coffee and how we're all drinking coffee. I would, I would say only really in the mid 2000s. I think prior to that, it was Nero and Starbucks. And then prior to that, it was a bit of coffee at home, maybe an Italian restaurant. But it, it's a new industry in the UK, but it's exploding. Um, so the market was, I can't go, I haven't gone back further, but over here, say, so is probably when we started, um, it was around the same. So the market's been pretty much like this for a while. It's been some big peaks due to like certain events that happen. This was a really interesting situation though that happened here because we ended up with uh, the 
well, the invasion of Ukraine, that really affected farmers because fertilizer typically comes from, came from Russia or came from Ukraine. And so you couldn't buy fertilizers. They're very expensive for farmers. Farmers need fertilizers. And actually the ones you might buy in Honduras or wherever, they're still produced somewhere else. Farmers use quite a lot of fuel because um, coffee is, tends to be grown in mountains and you need to move all your cherries around. So they use quite a lot of fuel and pickup trucks. Fuel is really expensive. Labour was really expensive because people had, were feeling the effects of inflation. They wanted more money for their farms. Pickers tend to get paid weekly. Uh, and so it's a bit more like the prices of this now. Inflation is astronomically like, more extreme actually in, in, in Central and South America. I'll talk mainly about Central and South America today because that's really where my kind of, most of my sourcing knowledge comes from and a bit about uh, Ethiopia. Um, yes, um, and so, uh, and also we were still lingering with the effects of COVID. Um, like, when did COVID end? 20, <laughs> has it ended? <laughs> when did it officially end? 2021, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of lingered for a bit more. And I think that, like, we are a bit more fortunate to all have vaccinations, but, like, we're talking about coffee farming is third world and developing countries mainly um, vaccination rates are much lower so actually like worry about covid was more extreme i traveled to honduras kind of when it actually like it was almost like they red flagged the country when i wanted to go but well, they did and then uh, as soon as it lifted i went and it was like i was quite chill but there everyone else was very very much like no not many people have been vaccinated in the country so and the healthcare system is not so good as it is here. So obviously people were a lot more worried. Um, that affected movement of people. So actually coffee pickers tend to move from farm to farm. You don't tend to have like full-time employees on a farm, maybe a few. Um, larger farms might have some permanent staff, but not pickers. Pickers tend to move around from farm to farm, um, which is exactly the same in the UK. I won't talk about Brexit because I hate it. But um, anyway, um, we're having problems like that too in agriculture in the UK too, because we've lost People who tend to pick fruit, it's much harder now. So actually, if you look at most fruit pickers in the UK now, they're from non-European countries. In Colombia, for example, most pickers are from Venezuela. They move around, they're looking for work. Picking coffee is really hard work, like really hard work. Um, and Brazil, uh, there's almost no pickers because they use machinery because labor costs are too high. So I'm going back to all this. This is all the result of us not paying very much money historically for coffee. Um, and that's no fault of the consumer. That's entirely the fault of um, less caring roasteries and like larger companies who would typically just want to buy cheap coffee, really cheap and old cheap coffee and like market it and sell it on. And I don't think we knew better, but like we didn't know as much. Um, like it was really hard to access unique coffees. Um, you, you could typically buy coffees that were sold as single origin. It's like, cool, that's from Brazil. That's one huge country, you know? Whereas, like, actually now we're talking, like, single farm, single lot, all these things. And these are a result of, like, challenges and questions going back. These things will cost more money. Uh, these things cost more money. Um, and also there's a lot more investment for farmers to do in their land. They get less yield. All these factors come into pricing. Um... I put here, while we don't buy commodity coffee, a change to the floor price would, of course, raise price across the board. I'm going to explain some of those reasons. Um, the way that we buy coffee, um, and a way that I think a lot of specialty roasters should buy coffee, um, is kind of through uh, kind of like looking at kind of fixed pricing or longer term contracts. Like, we don't do any direct purchasing with farmers. Um, there's one or two that we go and visit every year, and we have a great connection with them. But we do our buying through an import company who, on our behalf, will do the negotiation for us. That might sound quite challenging to a lot of people because a lot of people are like, you don't do direct trade. But for me, direct trade is um, knowing who your coffee comes from, understanding where you buy it from, committing to buy it every year, not just going and saying, I've done direct trade. It's good because direct trade can be really bad. It could be like, cool, I do direct trade. I buy the cheapest coffee possible. I know exactly why I'm paying for it. I control all of this. Security comes for producers from volume. So 
Um, I'll mention that a little bit later on about talking about volumes and some of the volumes that we buy coffees for, but that has the biggest impact for a farmer um, because of everything's per kilo, per pound. So like, you know, you could grow the best geisha in the world and it's amazing and everyone's like, wow, it won this award and it's brilliant. But if I grow 30 kilos, like, I, can't sell, I can't make that much revenue when I grow like five containers, which is 18 tons. That's a lot of coffee. That's a lot of $1.85 per pound, you know, or uh, £4.7. Put it in, put it in um, non-American money. Um, we'll probably go back to that in the UK soon, no post-Brexit. Um, so uh, that's agreeing these is, is we work with import companies because they are the ones that have more capacity to sell more coffee to, to more roasters and more consumers. They're the ones that, w that can finance the coffee up front. They're the ones that have the relationship. Most farmers that grow really good quality coffee will not sell straight up to anyone. They will only want to work with an importer because that gives them security, it gives them contracts, it gives them peace of mind. It's really easy for me as a buyer owning a coffee roastery to be a bit more fickle and be like, oh yeah, just this cup isn't quite as good, you know, like, oh, and like, that's not what a farmer needs. You need to work through it all year because the harvests change, things taste better some years. And I've, I've bought coffees that they haven't been as good as they were the previous year, but I'm pretty, want, I want to commit to buy them each year. Um, and typically import companies are much less likely to break a relationship with a farmer than a roaster would. Um, so that's my little bit on direct trade. Um, but it is good. Uh, right, a couple of producers we work with. What time is it? Okay, yeah. I'll push on a bit. Um, Marisa Bell and Moises. Uh, Marisa Bell called me her Latino son recently, which is, uh, <laughs> and she's my Latino mum. She is amazing. Her, she inherited uh, her farms from her father. Uh, and Moises, uh, he, he was an evil coffee salesman who was buying up all the farms. He's Guatemalan, she's uh, from Honduras, and they met, and then they, they now have the most amazing farm, and um, they do fantastic work. They won a program called Cup of Excellence. I don't know if you've heard of Cup of Excellence. Cup of Excellence is like the competition of all competitions for coffee farmers. For me, it's the one that really is like the stamp of like, you are the best farmer within your country. Like if you win Cup of Excellence, it genuinely changes producers' lives. You know, they're the ones then that have, um, it's like a massive stamp of approval. Um, they won it, I can't remember, uh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, and they don't compete in it anymore because they want other producers. They don't want to, they have the potential to win it every year, but they don't want to do it because they want other f farmers to have a, a, the same successes that they've got from it. Um, so uh, I won't go too in depth, um, but you, I want to talk a little bit about again about pricing, just so it's clear what some of these things you might read or see mean, and they're very confusing. They're very confusing for someone who works in coffee and buys coffee, so they're extremely confusing and usually very closed for a coffee consumer. First one is this, FOB. Has anyone seen this term, F-O-B? Yep. It just means free on board. It's a typical like, word used for like, how most buying is done of commodities or goods. And then um, that is all well and good to show your FOB price of like their 7.05 7 US dollars per kilo. However, that is paid to the exporter. That's not to the farmer. Um, larger farmers like Marisa Bell and Moises, they have their own export license. An export license is only really worth it if you've got more than a container to export. Most coffee farmers don't even grow a container. So if in, Af in, in East Africa, most coffee farmers might grow 15 bags of coffee, like 15 sacks. So that's a 60 kilo bag. So there's no way they're going to have an export license. Also, they might not be allowed to have an export license because that's the way businesses are there. They might not have a business. It's sustained. It's like more hand to mouth kind of style of living. And they might be growing the coffee to pay for fruit and veg at the market. That's the reality of, of how things are in some countries. So 
Showing an FOB price is a positive thing to do from a transparency point of view, but it's also then it's money going to someone in the middle still. It's going to the exporter. They're the exporter themselves, so that's great. So I know that their money's going straight to them. In turn, the sustainability and the work they do is really positive because they actually employ several hundred people and they keep on 20 full-time staff throughout the year. They also grow, um, they grow, <laughs> as I looked at him growing a tree. They built schools, they don't grow schools. <laughs> um, uh, and so they uh, really care about people in their community. So like, when you go and meet people like this, you actually realise that, that, that what we talk about in terms of sustainability, it's happening on their farms. Like, all, only positive things come from buying their coffee. Well, not only, but like, some, that sounds a bit stupid. But it's like, you know things are right just by meeting them and going and visiting. For me, when I talk about direct relationships, that is really important. Um, so I, I kind of know when we buy from them that like everything back is being looked after. All the people on the farm, all the pickers, people's health being looked after. You know, they're not exploiting people. This is really common in the coffee industry. Like it's it's like there's big problems. If, people have surely read about them, kind of the issue with cocoa as well. And there's like a lot of modern slavery involved. It's the same in the coffee industry. It's it's, it's bad. You know, but like when you have more knowledge about where things are being grown and you're aware of it, you, you, can, you can enjoy it, the produce so much more. Um, I think that's, that's core. That's, that's absolutely fundamental to a business. You should, not, you should like not support something if you don't really know. Well, it's very hard to do. It's so self-righteous to be like, oh yeah, I only do this, but it's difficult. And like money is a really important factor in that. Um, and actually, quality of produce is important in that too, because you can buy some really expensive things that are just horrible, not nice. <laughs> um, but you, you kind of know when you taste something that like, okay, this has been produced with love, and that's really, really important. Um, there also, this is, I'll go a bit of land sustainability. This is an example of uh, pruning. This is very aggressive pruning. In fact, this is called stumping. This is where the coffee tree is grown and you're starting to get less yield. So you just literally cut the whole tree right down and it will grow back. So rows of four, that's how they do things. So that's why we see this planted like this. Um, every fourth year, stump the whole lot. So you constantly have like a, like a children growing up and then but you don't stump your children. Um, there, that's how, that's how that works, and that, that's just encouraging better quality produce. That's really expensive for a farmer to do, like really expensive, because that's going to take three or four years to start really producing good quality fruit. So you've got to be confident that you've got a market for your coffee. That's a hard decision for a lot of farmers. Um, in, uh, in Ethiopia, I've seen some trees that like, would be like, up to the ceiling in here. And they're super bendy, so you can just like bend them down, pick a few cherries, and that's how it is. If you want to get really nice, dense amounts of like fat cherries each year, that's what you need to do. But that that's obviously requires confidence in revenue. Another challenge of a farm. <laughs> this is pretty vertical. This farm. Uh, this is like a, this is in, uh, in Antioquia, outside of Medellin in Colombia. Um, that's your farm. That's like bonkers, right? Like, that's 45 degrees. Um, that's hard work. That's like, you know, this, this guy, this is high as well. I, 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 we didn't, I, I, sounds like I don't, I can't remember the name of this, this young farmer, but he had planted, all of that is geisha in the background. Like all of these little shrubs you can see in this very, very high quality projector that I've got, which looks like something out of Minecraft. But, um, <laughs> He's done this because it's 2,000 meters, his farm, and like, why not grow geisha? It grows really well at altitude. He knows he can get really good revenue for it. Um, it's really risky, though, because it's like a really weak pro product, like a really weak varietal, um, and it's very, very like, non-resilient. So uh, we were like, OK, cool. But he's like really young, and he's like, oh, a geisha gets the most money. And so we were a bit like, this is really high risk strategy. You could get incredible value, but your whole crop could fail. Like you should mix things up, maybe try growing some Colombia and some Katura 
grow some catamore, which is like not a very tasty varietal, but it will always give you some volume so you can work on things. This is some of the dangers I've seen with a lot of roasters who travel and just like, I want to buy geisha, I want to buy anaerobic naturals, I want to buy this, this is what the market wants, but it's like not sympathetic to what the land wants or not sympathetic to what their revenue or their supply needs. Um, luckily for this guy, I think I, I, he seems to have his head switched on and um, he was uh, working with Juan, who, who we buy all of our, most of our Colombian coffee from. If you've ever drank a coffee in here called uh, La Claudina, if you've seen that, or you've drank Unit 14, you probably all had Unit 14 if you've had a coffee in here at some point because it's a, it's a common coffee. Um, we, unit 14 is our house espresso. I'm, gonna, I'm only really talking about our house coffees because for me, they're the ones that have the most impact. Um, Caballero we use here. You can see um, it's in our summer autumn collection. Uh, and uh, this is in our, also in our summer autumn collection. Right now we're in our winter collection, which is Estrella Divina from Peru. Um, same things here, you can see FOB price. I'll talk about the next one, price paid to producer. Um, COP, 2.92 uh, mil cargo parchment. Cool, nice, thanks. You haven't got a clue what that means. Um, each country has its own system for weighing coffee, um, which is super logical, right? You're like, why don't we just use either pounds or grams? Nope, uh, we'll use a cargo. Uh, a carga is 125 kilos. Yeah, uh, and uh, COP is Colombian pesos, um, and it's in parchment. So it means it's in its. That means it's only washed. Colombia only recognises washed coffees. It does not recognise naturals. So if you grow naturals, you have no commercial price. So. If I grow, that's the same with the farmers. They're like, oh, the, the buyers want anaerobic naturals. Cool. The Federation of Colombian Coffee does not recognize a natural. So I can't sell my produce. So I have to have a buyer for it. So these, a lot of these young farmers are like, you, this is really risky. You're, you're growing all of this to grow naturals, but you can't sell that to... Has anyone ever seen Colombian Excelso in the supermarket? That's base Colombian coffee. That's the marketed way of saying commodity coffee from Colombia. Brazilian Santos, that's another classic. That's like just Brazil. What that means is everything. So, so if that farmer's coffee is rubbish, it's going in Excelso. So all his geisha is getting in a blend, um, but they won't buy naturals. So only carga, so coffee and parchment. Um, so that's, but at least we know the value to the farmer. So that's what, he, that's what he's paid. Also, Juan, if he buys coffee, um, from this guy, apologies for not remembering his name, um, uh, he'll pay him that price. That's an internal price in Colombia. So in Colombia have internal prices. Not guaranteed that price, that was the price on that day. So also, obviously it's a market that's fluctuating. Um, Juan as well, like, yeah, again, um, this is very typical. If you get to meet coffee farmers outside of a coffee producing country, they're usually quite wealthy. Um, and they're, 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 more, they're more like dealing with export. You can see he's, this is actually parchment here. So this doesn't look like really bad coffee. It's just still in parchment. In Colombia, it's called pergamino. So in most Spanish-speaking Spanish, most Spanish -speaking countries, which happens to be most of the coffee producing region in Central and South America, other than Brazil, uh, this is common. So he will accept samples from farmers locally. He buys their produce and then he sells it on. Um, as an exporter. So he's doing really good groundwork. So he's helping a lot of young farmers help improve their quality. Uh, this is William in the background. He's, um, uh, he started out with Juan's dad as a picker and now is the manager of one of the farms. Um, he knows way more about the farms than Juan does, which is quite normal. Um, I did the same thing in some respects today. A customer asked for a quote on a espresso machine and I did it all wrong and see my colleague did a much better job. Quite normal, focus on your specialties. So Juan, um, he now has built his own mill where he like, mills the coffee and exports it. Um, they do a lot of really good stuff as well in their, in their local community and that's, that's really encouraging. Um, but those conversations, they didn't happen that naturally for Juan, if I'm honest. I've known him for quite a long time, but it's actually through more meetings with his buyers, more meetings with um, their uh, import partner, who we use for most of our coffee, who are based in Norway. 
Um, he's definitely uh, had a bit more kind of uh, enlightenment, shall we say, you know, like he, his dad's, he just wants to grow commodity coffee. He doesn't care. And he's put, took, taken over his dad's farms. We met his dad and he's like, oh, I don't know why you bother with this. It's so much work. You know, he was happier just farming and, and doing this. But for me, it's actually, that's driving the industry forward and it will help. He, this is an example of climate change in Colombia. Colombia's like so many microclimates that the really high altitude coffees um, are working really well. Anything below 1,400 meters is starting to taste quite poor and sometimes won't get the right points to even be classed as specialty coffee, even though it's like, that's, I go back to this, you're like, how could that be? But when, when you're talking like that kind of geographical relief, like your farm, which is maybe like the size of like an average supermarket's car park, they're really different altitudes very quickly because that, that relief is so extreme. So um, a lot of farmers I've met in Colombia at the lower altitudes now, they're just planting like native wood trees because they can cut down the trees and use it for things, then replant them. Or they're growing plantain because that's a crop they can grow, which gives them instant revenue. A lot are growing avocados because um, that's a really high value crop. Uh, quite a lot of farmers I've met in Colombia are cutting down all their trees to grow avocados because there's more money in avocados. But that's also like, that's a change in culture as well, right? Like more people are eating vegetarian food. Avocados is a really prized crop. And it's obviously not just vegetarians eat avocados, but it's becoming more normal. But at the same time, why not change your crop that you're growing? This is common. Like we, we think of it as like, oh, these farmers, this is the best because we're like, this is the coffee I love. But... For a lot of farmers, it's, it's still just a crop, you know, and that's how, they, that's how they'll look at things. And they're very smart trying to work out what's the best and how to market what they're doing. I do think it's important, though, I'm quite, I'm quite talky now, but I'm quite reserved when I'm on a coffee farm because, like, I, I don't... I can have good chats with Juan and with Marisa Bell, but when I've met some... Um, uh, I've overused this picture. I mean, it looks like he's at Western Supermare on a donkey, but... Uh, <laughs> Juan's, Juan's true love in life is horses. So we go to his farm, that's a donkey in the back or a mule. Uh, he made me get on one and I was like, I really don't want to go on that. I don't want to go on a donkey. And he was like, oh, yeah, 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 it'd be great. And of course I get on it and I'm like, I'm there like, <laughs> it just stops. And he's like, okay, great. And so I, I said, I'm, I feel much more confident walking. But um, the ultimate status symbol in Colombia, you can scrap your for, we just saw a Lamborghini earlier just doing laps as we went for lunch. <laughs> if you have a horse in Colombia, like a really good horse, that's like status. If you see narcos, you see how passionate they are about horses. Like Juan is, Juan actually studied in Germany. He grew up in, his family are from Medellin and he grew up, he's late 30s, early 40s. So he, 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 he left because it was so dangerous. And the road to their farm is, um, like three hours, four hours drive from Medellin, but it's only like 20, it's only about like 90 kilometers. But it's just the, the roads are so bad and they're like this. Uh, he said it was so violent back in the day and a lot of the farmers in his area, that's where all of Pablo's uh, labs were around the area and so the land was a complete write-off. Uh, lots of shrewd business people in the 90s when actually they had to get rid of all of those um, kind of all of those issues in Colombia, which obviously still exist today, but at the same time were pretty, pretty rife back then and could get away with it more. Um, the, the farms were in ruin and also it came at a time where the commodity price completely crashed. And so why am I bother gonna grow, why am I gonna bother growing coffee? So all the farms are abandoned. So you could buy the farms super cheap. So Juan's, uh, Juan's dad bought a farm just because it was really cheap. He didn't know about coffee, he's an engineer and his son was in, in, in Germany studying, but you know, um, Juan's got into it and like, that's really positive and that's happening quite a lot. And you're seeing like, people who are like, wanna actually do good things, but and, like, that's the result of like, the kind of change. I'm uh, very quick, I'm quite aware of time. Do you wanna pop those kettles on? Because yeah. they take about 10 or 15, 10, five or 10 minutes. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, El Salvador was quite sad actually when I went to go and visit. El Salvador was once the largest coffee producing, one of the largest producers in, uh, in the world. And it's now really a tiny producing country. But the infrastructure is still there from when it was huge. And you could, 
it's it's almost like going to like um, Chernobyl. You know, you can go to these farms and you just see these absolutely huge dryers and these huge equipment, and it's all abandoned because the market crashed and the land was expensive. And so people bought coffee somewhere else. And that, that is happening, but that's also proof that things are changing and that, that it will always adapt, you know. Um, but it has left a lot of people... Um, well, actually, another big problem in El Salvador was actually something called roya, which is leaf rust, which is a fungal infection. That kind of blew through. Sounds like, uh, how, how, how can it be? But it devastates your farm. And that was a big issue with, like, kind of monocultures almost, you know. Like, we don't think of it in that way, but... You know, farming, it, it looks so different in different countries, how it looks different in countries here. If you look at like a British farm with all its hedges and dry walls, and there's a reason for that, and that's like because of agricultural revolution and land ownership and <clears throat> similar here. Um, Central America, there's, it's really like, there's hands in very few, um, the, 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 all the wealth, sorry, is in very few hands. And so there's, there's big aristocratic families that own everything. Um, and they weren't very sensible with how they divided their land. There was just coffee everywhere. And so when these fungal infections come in, there was nothing to break it up. And that's kind of why Marissa Ben and Moises trial these things. And they pass that on to communities, which is really helpful. Uh, tourist snap, there I am, with a beard and looking a bit younger. Um, anyway, um, I want to just briefly talk about the example of a really small farmer that we like a small farmer that sounds harsh, a small producer we work with and I want to just I want to focus on Rolando Cordoba this guy I met in Colombia there's a competition uh, in um, Colombia I used to do every year called uh, the Taki Cup and it was a local community um, called Taki which is in the south in a place called Huila which is H-U-I-L-A um, and uh, there's a competition amongst farmers so we would go, we'd taste loads of different coffees. They would compete with each other to screw the best lot. These, this, these farms are remote, like really remote. Like it's a four hour walk for Rolando to get to his local town, which has like a bar and like one shop and a barber. Um, and a lot of them as well are uh, related. So this competition is strong. It's really good. And the coffees from there, they are unique and sometimes could taste like Kenyan coffees. So it's a real pleasure going and like judging the competition. Um, and we met him and he produced 200 kilos of coffee, which was sublime. And like it was used by one of our customers in Prague in the World Barista Championships. Um, and he, I think he got the 18th best espresso, which sounds quite poor, but actually, if you really think about it, he was competing with a Variedad Colombia. So like a government led crop against Panama geishas and anaerobic naturals and all these wild and wonderful things. And this was just a wash Colombian coffee. So it's like really unique coffee that he grew. Um, he only grew 20 bags of coffee a year. So we started buying all of his coffee. And then as a result of Brexit, we can no longer buy his coffee. And that is very sad. I could try my hardest to try and get it in, but it's the, the exporter that I can only buy his coffee through we will not sell to the UK anymore. So these are some of the issues that we face too, where we want to have nice relationships and maintain things, but there's other things that prevent us from doing so. Um, we're now setting up a coffee roastery within the European Union, and I very much hope I can buy this coffee again. But that's typical of like how things work and how relationships have to change. Um, and it's quite difficult because he knew that we'd buy all of his coffee pretty much each year and he would make sure it was the right quality. But now he's, I'm sure he's sold his coffee somewhere else because it's fantastic and there's always going to be another buyer. Um, but maybe not. But also uh, probably during the uh, right now with the internal price is probably quite high in Colombia. He's probably quite secure. But the, the competition lot we bought from him was great. He ended up buying a motorbike to have to walk into town. That's like a great thing. Um, and that's just a really nice thing that you can do through buying something that's quality. I wouldn't have met him if I hadn't tasted such nice coffee. Um, I didn't know any of the farmers when we taste the coffees. It's all blind. Tonight we're going to taste things, seeing what they are. It's a big no-no when you're buying because it's, it, will, it will change your perception. Um, if I'm drinking a Brazil or a Kenya, I know what it should be like before going in best not to know so this was this was really quite a unique rare nice thing to kind of to, to be part of um, 
Uh, this is in Ethiopia. Um, I was quite lucky to travel to Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia has like, changed dramatically in 10 years. In fact, it's changed dramatically in five years. Um, Ethiopia is divided into many growing regions. It's many tribes as well in the growing regions, different, um, different tribes of people, different dialects, different uh, land ownership, different communities, different cultures. Um, and the government really controlled everything. It's a closed currency in Ethiopia. The, the, local, the local money, Jeez, can't be said. Their economy, it's called the bir, um, and it's uh, closed, so you can't take it with you. Um, you can, so it's a bit like if you go to Morocco, it's a kind of closed currency too, um, which means it's problematic for them if they want to export because uh, the coffee industry is dollars, dollars only. So business people in Ethiopia, they set their export companies up to get dollars in the country. That's some of the main reasons. So they will export coffee just for dollars. So there's a lot of difficult business in Ethiopia and it's, a, it's getting a lot better because the government are... It was actually really good when the government controlled it because they protected the commodity and it was really regimented. And then it became a bit like cowboy for a while as it adapted because you could export with an export license. But now it's kind of matured and it's, it's really improved. So when we buy Ethiopian coffee now, we know usually where it's from. Like we've got an Ethiopian honey that we're going to taste later. I can tell you where it's from. We know the region. We don't know the varietal because it's all wild coffee. So we just call it heirloom or land race. It's basically just typica. But um, yeah, you'll see Ethiopian heirloom. It means like, I know, mystery blend, but it's delicious. Um, uh, and it's become a lot better. And there's some really, really good work uh, for some amazing people in Ethiopia where you're actually starting to understand where it's from. Um, it's not the easiest picture to tell, but it's very typical in uh, Ethiopia that the, the men will do a lot of the picking and the, the women will look after the kind of production side. That's quite normal. Um, uh, and you can see in this slightly like um, depth of field problem uh, pitch, depth of field heavy picture, you can see all the drying beds in the background. And you can see it's yellow, which is a bit odd, but that's because it's coffee's in parchment still, so it's drying in its parchment. Um, here you can see they look like chickens, but they're, they're sheds, but they're not, they're raised beds. Um, and the uh, coffee will stay on here for 10, 10 to 15 days if it's washed, if it's natural, sometimes a bit longer. The way Ethiopian coffee is harvested is they put all the work into washed coffees first and then naturals come later. So when you're buying, naturals always arrive a month later than washed coffees. However, in Ethiopia, they will hold the coffee until the price is right. That's super normal for the exporters to do even though you're desperate for the new seasons Ethiopias. But sometimes the new seasons Ethiopias don't taste as good as the ones from last year. Uh, we've got an example of this. This is the last, well, I'll tell what the coffees are, we'll, we'll know what we're tasting. Um, but they're all from, not from this year. Harvest in Ethiopia is December, uh, like November until January, but they're from the year before. But uh, they, they're tasting really good, but everything's delayed this year, so we don't have anything fresh. Um, there's another example. What they're doing is they're really just um, picking out any defects ahead of going through production, basically. So, um, <laughs> uh, Moises once called it combat coffee, is what he said. That's what is drank internally. So when people are like, oh, I'm going to a coffee producing country, the coffee's going to be amazing. No, it's going to be dire, because it's going to be whatever is left is, go is, is what's drank. Ethiopia, by law, cannot keep grade one quality coffees within the country. They have to be exported. And that's government controlling economies. But these are big economies. Like, it's a hugely traded commodity coffee. And I think that we don't think of it sometimes that way, but it's, it's a monster. And in these uh, agricultural communities and agricultural, in countries where agriculture is core to the business revenue, that's great. You know, it's a huge employer. So, um, uh, it's important to keep that revenue back to the country. Um, Ethiopia is really unique though because the people of Ethiopia love coffee and coffee ceremony is a really important part of Ethiopian culture um, and they would like to keep good quality coffee in the country. So often we take back grade one coffees that's been exported, we've roasted it and when we visit we might take some back and they're like very happy to have it. Uh, Colombia is another example where always when we visit our Colombian farmers and friends we take anything that's not Colombian because it's really hard to import non-Colombian coffees into Colombia. 
because the government wants to control things. Um, uh, this is, haven't been, this is a photograph from our import company. It's somewhere I'm really keen to go, it's Uganda. Um, Uganda is a really big producer of robusta, low quality coffee. I didn't explain that, but I assume with everyone's ultra high um, knowledge base tonight, the difference between Arabica and robusta. But robusta is very commonly grown and um, is super commercial. But um, so there's all the facilities to produce great coffee because you still need the same equipment. But my God, the, the understanding and the love is not there. But it's starting to happen in some of these countries with the work of import companies. If you look at those cherries, it's like, it's wonderful. Um, um, called Taki, which is in the south, and a place called Wheeler, which is H-U-I-L-A. Um, and uh, there's a competition amongst farmers. So we would go, we'd taste loads of different coffees. They would compete with each other to screw the best lot. These, this, these farms are remote, like really remote. Like it's a four hour walk for Rolando to get to his local town, which has like a bar and like one shop and a barber. Um, and a lot of them as well are uh, related. So this competition is strong. It's really good. And the coffees from there, they are unique and sometimes could taste like Kenyan coffees. So it's a real pleasure going and like judging the competition. Um, and we met him and he produced 200 kilos of coffee, which was sublime. And like it was used by one of our customers in Prague in the World Barista Championships. Um, and he, I think he got the 18th best espresso, which sounds quite poor, but actually, if you really think about it, he was competing with a Variedad Colombia, so like a government-led crop against Panama geishas and anaerobic naturals and all these wild and wonderful things. And this was just a washed Colombian coffee. So it's like really unique coffee that he grew. Um, he only grew 20 bags of coffee a year, so we started buying all of his coffee. And then as a result of Brexit, we can no longer buy his coffee. And that's very sad. I could try my hardest to try and get it in, but it's the, the exporter that I can only buy his coffee through who will not sell to the UK anymore. So these are some of the issues that we face too, where we want to have nice relationships and maintain things, but there's other things that prevent us from doing so. Um, we're now setting up a coffee roastery within the European Union, and I very much hope I can buy his coffee again. But that's typical of like, how things work and how relationships have to change. Um, and it's quite difficult because he knew that we'd buy all of his coffee pretty much each year, and he would make sure it's the right quality. But now he's, I'm sure he's sold his coffee somewhere else because it's fantastic and there's always going to be another buyer. Um, but maybe not. But also, uh, probably during the uh, right now with the internal price, is probably quite high in Colombia. He's probably quite secure. But the, the competition lot we bought from him was great. He ended up buying a motorbike because he didn't have to walk into town. That's like a great thing. Um, and that's just a really nice thing that you can do through buying something that's quality. I wouldn't have met him if I hadn't tasted such nice coffee. Um, I didn't know any of the farmers when we taste the coffees. It's all blind. Tonight we're going to taste things, seeing what they are. It's a big no-no when you're buying because it's, it, will, it will change your perception. Um, if I'm drinking a Brazil or a Kenya, I know what it should be like before going in. It's best not to know. So this was, this was really quite a unique, rare, nice thing to kind of to, to be part of. Um, uh, this is in Ethiopia. Um, I was quite lucky to travel to Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia has like changed dramatically in 10 years. In fact, it's changed dramatically in five years. Um, Ethiopia is divided into many growing regions. It's many tribes as well in the growing regions, different, um, different tribes of people, different dialects, different uh, land ownership, different communities, different cultures. Um, and the government really controlled everything. It's a closed currency in Ethiopia. The, the, local, the local money, Jesus, I can't be sure. It's called the bir, um, and it's uh, closed, so you can't take it with you. Um, you can, so it's a bit like if you go to Morocco, it's a kind of closed currency too, um, which means it's problematic for them if they want to export because uh, the coffee industry is dollars, dollars only. So business people in Ethiopia, they set their export companies up to get dollars in the country. That's some of the main reasons. So they will export coffee just for dollars. So there's a lot of difficult business in Ethiopia. 
and it's, a, it's getting a lot better because the government, uh, it was actually really good when the government controlled it because they protected the commodity and it was really regimented. And then it became a bit like cowboy for a while as it adapted because you could export with an export license. But now it's kind of matured and it's, it's really improved. So when we buy Ethiopian coffee now, we know usually where it's from. Like we've got an Ethiopian honey that we're going to taste later. I can tell you where it's from. We know the region. We don't know the varietal because it's all wild coffee. So we just call it heirloom or land race. It's basically just typica. But um, yeah, you'll see Ethiopian heirloom. It means like, I don't know, mystery blend, but it's delicious. Um, uh, and it's become a lot better. And there's some really, really good work uh, for some amazing people in Ethiopia where you're actually starting to understand where it's from. Um, it's not the easiest picture to tell, but it's very typical in uh, Ethiopia that the, the men will do a lot of the picking and the, the women will look after the kind of production side. That's quite normal. Um, uh, and you can see in this slightly like um, depth of field problem uh, pitch, depth of field heavy picture, you can see all the drying beds in the background. And you can see it's yellow, which is a bit odd, but that's because it's coffee's in parchment still, so it's drying in its parchment. Um, here you can see they look like chickens, but they're, they're sheds, but they're not, they're raised beds. Um, and uh, coffee will stay on here for 10, 10 to 15 days if it's washed, if it's natural, sometimes a bit longer. The way Ethiopian coffee is harvested is they put all the work into Wash coffees first and then naturals come later. So when you're buying, naturals always arrive a month later than wash coffees. However, in Ethiopia, they will hold the coffee until the price is right. That's super normal for the exporters to do, even though you're desperate for the new seasons Ethiopias. But sometimes the new seasons Ethiopias don't taste as good as the ones from last year. Uh, we've got an example of this. This is the last, well, I'll tell what the coffees are. We'll, we'll know what we're tasting. Um, but they're all from, not from this year. Harvest in Ethiopia is December, uh, like November until January, but they're from the year before. But uh, they, they're tasting really good, but everything's delayed this year, so we don't have anything fresh. Um, there's another example. What they're doing is they're really just um, picking out any defects ahead of going through production, basically. So, um, <laughs> uh, M Moises once called it combat coffee, is what he said. That's what is drank internally. So when people are like, oh, I'm going to a coffee producing country, the coffee's going to be amazing. No, it's going to be dire, because it's going to be whatever is left is, is, is what's drank. Ethiopia, by law, cannot keep grade one quality coffees within the country. They have to be exported. And that's government controlling economies. But these are big economies. Like, it's a hugely traded commodity coffee. And I think that we don't think of it sometimes that way, but it's, it's a monster. And in these uh, agricultural communities and agricultural, in countries where agriculture is core to the business revenue, that's great. You know, it's a huge employer. So um, uh, it's important to keep that revenue back to the country. Um, Ethiopia is really unique though, because the people of Ethiopia love coffee. And coffee ceremony is a really important part of Ethiopian culture. Um, and they would like to keep good quality coffee in the country. So often we take back grade one coffees that's been exported. We've roasted it, and when we visit, we might take some back. And they're like very happy to have it. Uh, Colombia is another example. We're always, when we visit our Colombian farmers and friends, we take anything that's not Colombian because it's really hard to import non Colombian coffees into Colombia because the government wants to control things. Um, uh, this is, haven't been, this is a photograph from our import company. It's somewhere I'm really keen to go, it's Uganda. Um, Uganda is a really big producer of Robusta, low quality coffee. I didn't explain that, but I assume with everyone's ultra high um, knowledge base tonight, the difference between Arabica and Robusta. But Robusta is very commonly grown and um, is super commercial. But um, so there's all the facilities to produce great coffee because you still need the same equipment. But my God, the, the understanding and the love is not there. But it's starting to happen in some of these countries with the work of import companies. If you look at those cherries, it's like, it's wonderful. Um, but I tasted the coffees for five or six years. In the first year, they were really bad. And then the second year, they are a bit better. We bought them two years ago, and they are now really, really, really good. Um, the issue was with Uganda is um, it's uh, more difficult to get coffee to a port than it would be if you're in Kenya. Um, 
Kenya has got some corruption issues and they are very protective of exporting Kenyan coffees before all other countries. But if you're in Rwanda and Burundi, you usually export through Kenya and they will keep things for a bit longer to make sure other things go out. Uh, Uganda as well, same, same kind of things. So the coffee um, sits in a container on a port somewhere and uh, it's hot and it ages. And then you end up with poor tasting coffee and that's happened quite a lot. It's to do with infrastructure of getting things from A to B as well. These are all part of that supply chain, which is why direct trade is great, but quite stressful. Um, I'm very keen to travel and, and taste these. If you um, see coffees from us, which are called Zunuli or Bulambuli, um, that's, from, that's from this washing station. It's the Bulambuli washing station. Um, I thought I'd include this. this is a photograph of the Taki Cup in Colombia. I think this is like, for me, was like a real buzz. Um, uh, any excuse to bust out a mad shirt. And um, <laughs> I, I also, in honor of the, these are not farmers, these are uh, Q graders. Um, if you've heard of Q grading, um, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of, I don't, I'm not a Q grader. Uh, Joanne, who's head buyer for Nordic Approach, one of the most kind of influential coffee import companies, she's not a Q grader. People are like, what? But it's, it's not relevant. It's relevant, of course, but it, it's really relevant internally in countries. You know, like these, these guys, they work for Fairfield Trading, but they work for a lot of other export companies and they will give that stamp of approval. Every farmer at this Tarkey Cup, they're like, did I score 86 points? That's all they want to know. And you say, yes, the coffee scored 86.25 points. And they are like, beers out get the cigarettes on the go, let's have a party. And that's what happened in Turkey. Then I went absolutely wild and we we're barbecuing all kinds of stuff and letting off fireworks because it's like they achieved that point, which means they're like credible specialty coffee. And that's really, really key. Because um, this exporter, Fairfield Trading, only buys 86, so they know their coffee's sold. So that's key, you know, like these are really important things. But I think this is like a nice image of like uh, Kaniko owns a coffee company called Weekenders in Kyoto in Japan. Um, and this is utter madness for this tiny town. They're like, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we went running in the morning and they're just like running around this tiny town. And these Colombians are just like, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a really tall white guy and a Japanese man. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's going on, you know? Uh, but they know that we're the cafe gringos. And uh, yeah, everyone's a cafe gringo if you're foreign in these parts. Oh yeah, this. Um, this is a coffee tasting wheel. I'm sure you might have seen one of these before. Um, this just gives us an indication of like aromas, flavors, tastes, things we're tasting. Um, I always think it's quite fun to look at this because um, it kind of like really, for me, it kind of puts in different pers perspectives of coffee. Like this area here is like the kind of like holy grail of like commercial coffee. You've got like rubber, petroleum, uh, uh, phenolic, have you heard of phenolic? That's a defect in coffee, it's when it tastes like, like minerally, but like not nice. Um, Mouldy and damp, great flavors. Uh, tobacco, oh, delicious, um, but to smoke, not to drink. Um, and then I think we get into like the fun area over here. Like this is great, this is really nice. Actually, no, this is the nicer, this is like the really fun specialty area, I'd say, where it's like, oh, raspberry, floral, uh, aromatics, berries. This is like the kind of like comfy area, like, ooh, chocolate, almonds, nutty, delicious. This is the like problematic area of specialty for me. Like, I struggle with this. Um, I find that like, from a consumer perspective, quite a lot of the time, we get disappointed when we try specialty coffee because it's um, it can be sour or it can be acidic or it can be like uh, like you know like citric acid and uh, like these are like here like pea pod <laughs> that's a good one I, I don't want my, really want my coffee to taste like peas um, this can be a result of like under roasting of coffee this is quite common in the specialty coffee industry in my opinion is like the the fear of like here is so much that we don't go near it. We don't dare to caramelize things. It's like, if you, if you have like, if you, if you cook and you understand cooking, you understand caramelization. You, you don't want to have something that's like just cooked. You know, it needs to have like, there needs to be sugars basically. 
Um, and when we're roasting coffee, I always think of it as we're just cooking coffee. I haven't even mentioned roasting tonight. I kind of realised that's pretty core to what we do as a business. Every single, all of our revenue, every single bean we roast, I haven't mentioned it because actually there's, for me, there's a bigger, bigger story. I think it's a bit of a given that you should roast coffee nicely. However, what I roast might not be to your taste and that's totally fine. Commercial coffee is never roasted lightly because it never had the chance to taste good. So you burn it, so you replace flavors. You replace probably all of these are like defects. So you, you buy, when you buy commodity coffee, by the way, you're buying it on the amount of defects, not the quality. So quite often it's like, oh, you, I've, I've got friends that work in both specialty and commodity in buying, um, in, in, in um, importing. And it's great because the, the specialty guys will be like, oh yeah, so like I sold five bags of coffee today. And they'll be like, cool, I sold 10 containers. That's the reality and it's called a box. So you don't even call it a container. It's like sold five boxes of coffee, it's five containers worth. And that's typical for a large company that, you know, roasts two or 300 tons a day versus us who raised 50 tons a year. You can't get that quality. This is something I've been quite aggressive to, com to commercial coffees, but the reality is you, you, you need it. Like if you need that production, you need that revenue, but you, though the coffee's not great quality. So it's, it's good that it's being sold, but it's a shame that that's, it's a shame that that's what we've had for so long. That's like, I think that's the thing, you know, like, um, whereas, I think there's a lot more understanding and value in coffee now. I mean, like, I think the, the absolute pinnacle is like McDonald's doing a flat white. I know that sounds really basic, but it's actually really massive, massive thing to happen. Um, and the fact that like, it, it's so normalized now, specialty coffee, but there's, there's, there's this like future of it and this post development. This, we talk about these waves in coffee. I kind of hate it, but like, I think we're etern eternally in the third wave right now. Um, which is like this kind of, we're understanding produce and trying to develop it forward. Um, and we're, uh, we know we've got good equipment and we care about what it goes in and we care about what we're tasting. Um, uh, but anyway, in a re as a result, I think that um, for me, like this area is like where I'd like to focus on when I'm tasting. Because I kind of know if I'm here, I've done something wrong. I've either like got poor quality coffee I've either burnt it, which is not great, but has been done. It's quite easy to burn coffee. In fact, it's extremely easy to burn coffee. Um, the whole roasting process takes about 12 minutes and it goes to, we roast most of our coffee to about 205 to 215 degrees end temp. That's just very confusing for a lot of people, but it's, it's high, it's high temperatures. Uh, and it happens very quick. Uh, and it's very easy with the, get the powerful roasters to very quickly burn something. Um, but it's also very easy to under roast something. And like, uh, this is a bit of a, a kind of pet hate of mine actually, because I think it's almost more offensive to under roast a coffee than to over roast a coffee, because it makes it really hard for the consumer. Like if I've got a slightly over roasted coffee, I can deal with it. It's like, okay, cool, I can tweak it. If I've got an under roasted coffee, I feel like it's like it's like undercooked chicken. I don't really want that, you know. Like I think it's you haven't really given it the best opportunity. But it, there's, there comes a fear as a roaster when you're like, oh, I know how expensive this coffee is. I don't burn it. I pull it, and you're like, oh, you can't you can't pop it back in, you know. It's not like it's not like oh the, the bread needs a bit more. I'll I'll pop it in. It just it's it ends. So it's it's quite it's kind of a difficult area. However, I think. When you're new to specialty coffee, sometimes things can be sour because you're tasting acidity in coffee which you haven't tasted before. I've, I've often heard of sour and bitter being confused a lot, especially in espresso. I think espresso is like punishing as, a, as someone getting into coffee. Like filter and cu cupping, it's like, it's harder to find the flavors. I remember when I first started drinking coffee and getting into it, I was like, um, is it Rwandan? Oh, cool. Yeah. I thought it was a potato defect no, in Rwanda. No. <laughs> I'll briefly say what potato defect is. Um, uh, it's very common in coffees from Rwanda and Burundi. Um, it's a, just a defect in the, in the coffee, and when you grind it, it smells exactly like potatoes. 
and it tastes exactly like like roasted potatoes, but in a bad way, like a mouldy potato. And so it's um, it's very common that you um, and if you smell it, it, it instantly smell it in the in in the, in the air. Not very good if you're making large amounts of coffee. Um, I don't know what I was waffling on about there. Should we lay these out over here and yeah. I'll start pouring them? Yeah. I didn't take any questions. I'm sorry, I just talked. But does anyone have any questions? Yeah, just want to know about your approach in buying. What are the like, most minimum amounts you have purchased and the largest amount throughout the year? Yeah. Um, in, terms of, like, bags, if you could. in terms of bags, yeah. Um, uh, we're, not, we're going to cut one of them here. This is one of the largest purchases I've made, which is the first coffee here is Estrella Divina. I'm going to talk about the coffees instead of it being blind because it's just easier. Um, we bought 200 bags this um, uh, winter, and that will last us uh, from January-ish time until summer, and then we'll buy coffee from Juan about 100. The smallest purchase I bought was 30 kilos. 30 kilos, that's like half Yeah, a half a bag, yeah. Uh, not from the same place, but uh, from Caballero, is on their geishas. A uh, follow-up question to that, with 200, uh, obviously 200 bags, how do you manage the aging of coffee throughout the year? Because I'm assuming it's a yep. year-round option. Yeah, yeah, really good, really good question. Yeah, um, we, we manage it by using nature. Sounds a bit weird, but like that's why we are seasonal. So um, we, um, we don't, we, we want to move around with different coffees all year. There's, that's why I say it's interesting. We've got two coffees that are quite old. They're from East, East Africa, but we always like to have Kenya and Ethiopia on our list because they're really tasty um, and they sell very well. It's very, it sounds a bit salesy, but it's very important to us. Um, I'm really sorry. I've forgotten the second part of the question. What was it? So how do you manage it? How do you manage it? Um, we manage it by trying to sell it before it actually starts to age. That sounds a bit obvious but like for example that would be harvested in summer so we know there's a fresh crop so it would be probably done by then i've made some big mistakes and i will continue to make big mistakes 2022 i showed you that graph the price was really high i got very nervous because it was we were looking at really high pricing and people were also having um is that one hot yeah, that's yeah. do you want to pour them jeff yeah sure yeah? I'm going to go from left to right. Yeah, just try not pour on the plug. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking that. We made some big mistakes because we got nervous about the, the market. Our house espresso price suddenly went really high, which actually, why as consumers, you, you're looking at high pricing now because most of the coffees being sold still were really grown, might have been bought around that time. Um, we, we manage it by changing our list seasonally. So we work through the, the, the producing countries in a kind of seasonal way. So we, we never really have had a coffee that's older than one year from picking. With exception for these two, which are now 14 months from being picked. But I'm not tasting aging in them. You might be, but yeah. Aging in coffee is like um, when the coffee starts to taste Baggy. Is there a baggy on there? No, it's a bit of a... Oh, this area. Papery, woody cardboard. It's where the moisture content's really gone out of the coffee. And then you start to taste... The, you start to taste... We say it's baggy because it starts to taste like the thing it comes in, like a jute sack. Or if you went and smelt that doormat, that's kind of what the coffee would taste like. It's not very nice, but that's ageing, yeah. So, to kind of go back to the sustainability... Yeah. From a perspective of import, obviously, I understand that the control that you have of yep. how that coffee gets from you, from, from source to you, yep. is always going to be very challenging. What kind of things can, can be controlled? And is it something where if you as a roaster and as a collective group of roasters yep. back and say, hey, is there ways that we can change the shipping process? How does that then affect the end product? Not necessarily from a cost, but from a quality point of view. Mm. We collectively buy with a few roasters, but um, uh, logistics and transportation is not my skill set, and I don't think it's the skill set of a lot of roasters, but a lot of import companies have those kind of connections. But they also, import companies tend to buy from export companies as well, who tend to buy from farmers, who tend to be in co-ops too. So actually, like, getting through to that end farmer is really difficult. And I think that, like... Um, 
it depends what you're looking for. Like if you, in terms of quality, I think there's, I still, I still argue there's a great deal that happens through good import companies. Um, we don't have any today, but we've recently just bought two coffees from Indonesia, and that's a project that that import company has put so much work into with the, with that one farm. Um, I, I don't see that work happening with a lot of roasters. Um, so, is I I think it's a, is a second kettle boiled. Yeah. yeah. Is um. That collaboration is is great, but I still think it's it's hard in terms of that in terms of business, and it depends what you're looking for. Um, I think that it's quite. Uh, oh, sorry, I got this. No, it's quite straightforward. I think um, for the, for like those larger companies with bigger bigger volume and buying to, to do that work, which is better than what I can achieve, because at the same time I'm doing Instagram, doing this, doing this here, trying to do that. And my core focus is not on that on that place. And I think that's 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 why it's very important to have that. I still I still don't think I answered your question very well. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think it was more from a understanding that sustainability is the impact of importing any good, uh, any products or goods from a source location. Yes. Requires transportation. Transportation, yeah. fossil fuel, so on and so forth. Yes. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. In that respect, yeah. Uh, coffee, coffee is uh, honestly, it's a, it's like a, is hiding. It's gonna come out about it, but we're just really addicted to it, and I think that it, we kind of ignore it a little bit. But it's like. It's people, people are like. I know people who don't, who don't want to buy avocados because they know that its impact is a lot. Versus, these are all grown and shipped on in shipping containers, um, transported by petrol around farms, um, transported on trucks from farms. You know, it's problematic. We're starting to see some coffee come in by sailboat from Colombia, but it's so expensive, yeah. and it's not it's not cost effective to do it that way. So it's difficult. Um, no, I don't have any answers for that. No, that's okay. We don't use refrigerated containers, though, that some people do. Yeah. That's, that's, we wouldn't do that. Um, uh, I do have a follow-up question on that. Yeah. Uh, you do get samples from that same portal, like Nordica Pooch is giving you yeah. samples for you to decide what offerings you want to have for the rest of the year. Yep. When the coffee arrives to you in bulk, yep. there's obviously going to be differences. How... By what what expectations do you take with the coffee when it arrives in bulk? Do you prep for it knowing that it might not be the same standard of the sample that you receive? Um, because obviously it's not anyone's mistake in case if due in the shipping container the coffee yeah, yeah. undergoes any uh, alterations. We um we um have a contract. We have something that's called a pre pre shipment sample. So a ship a coffee sent before it shipped, then we have an arrival sample, and our contract will always be we'll accept it as an arrival, not as a pre-shipment. That's the other risk of doing direct trade, is you're buying at the farm, that's it, you bought it, the money's in the farmer's hands. So if that coffee has problems, then that's on you. Uh, we have very good relationships with the import company, so if we do have issues, we, we can address them. We are quite lucky that we haven't really addressed any major issues with some coffees we've bought. We had it with one coffee that Juan Saldariaga was making. He was making a blend of local farmers' coffees. And we had so much inconsistency, we, we did have to stop buying it, which is quite a difficult um, decision to make. Um, but it was, uh, they had, the, the import company had another buyer that wanted that coffee. So that was meant that the production was still there. So we bought it for two years, even though we had inconsistencies and we struggled with it. But then they're like, you do know there's another buyer. So we felt it was fine to do. Um, but there's feedback as well in that we can actually give feedback to producers and actually then they, they started to improve their milling process. So there is that there. We've never broken a contract as a company. That happens a lot. Roasters are like, oh, actually I don't like that today. I don't want that anymore. That's not good in my range anymore, but you, contra you wanted to buy it. So I've quite been quite fierce about that. That's like on me if I decide I don't like something. It's the reality of something that is objective, but still quite subjective on that day. You know, I could really like one coffee today and tomorrow I could be like not so into it. 